My name is Lucia D'Ambrioso. I'm a senior lecturer in global health um, and associate director of the Centre for Health Data Science in the School of Medicine here in the University of Aberdeen. And I'm really thrilled to um, introduce this session as part of our 2020 seminar series. And we're going to ask, what does follow the science really mean in the COVID-19 pandemic? We'll explore in this session relationships between evidence and policy in this global public health emergency. Rather than a discussion on what should be done about COVID, we will explore how decisions are made, by whom and on what basis. And that will help us think through our expectations and assumptions about <coughs> what and policy are. Um, and from which we'll be able to think about the roles of universities and public institutions in pandemic preparedness and response. We're joined by two highly distinguished guests today. Firstly, Professor Agnes Benaguejo joins us from Kigali in Rwanda. Prof Agnes is a Rwandan paediatrician who returned to Rwanda following <coughs> the genocide in the late 1990s and supported the health system both through clinical practice and in senior government positions. She worked as executive secretary of Rwanda's National AIDS Control Commission, then as permanent secretary of the Ministry of Health and for five years as Minister of Health. She's now vice chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity in the rural north of the country and is co-founder of this unique institution training global health professionals. She serves as senior advisor to the Director General of the World Health Organization, is senior lecturer at the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard, a professor of pediatrics at the University of Global Health Equity, a member of the US National Academy of Medicine and a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences. Prof Agnes is a global leader in evidence-based decision-making. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. We are also joined by Professor Paul Kearney from the University of Stirling here in Scotland. Professor <coughs> Kearney is an internationally renowned specialist in politics and public policy, whose work has brought us new understandings from policy studies to explain the use of evidence in politics and policy, and how policymakers translate long-term aims into evidence-informed objectives. He's worked, among other things, on the role of Scottish institutions in the lead up to our independence referendum here in Scotland, and also works regionally to build new understandings of how governments can and should use evidence to learn from policy successes and failures. Um, Paul has published widely, writing two new books this year and last on understanding complex public policy and on the difficulties around pre um, preventative health policies. And the latter provides new evidence and insights into what happens when governments make commitments without <coughs> necessarily knowing how to implement them. Thank you, Paul, for helping us to shape this seminar and for joining us today. Oh, thank you. And finally, our chair for the discussion will be at the University of Aberdeen, our principal and vice chancellor, Professor George Boyne. Um, Professor Boyne has led our university since 2018 and, among many other things, has reoriented us to our 1495 founding principle, in which we are, quote, open to all, dedicated to the pursuit of truth in service of others. And rooted in this purpose, Professor Boyne has encouraged staff and students across the university to come together and develop an ambitious 20-year strategy codifying these values into our future plans. And this was a plan launched this year as we celebrated our 525th anniversary. A world expert on performance in the public sector, Professor Boyne is leading our university in bold and new directions based on values of equity, inclusion and participation. I'm very grateful to him for um, taking time to chair our discussion today. So thank you and over to you, Principal. Thanks, Lucia. As anyone with an interest in this topic will know, there is a long-standing academic literature on evidence-based policymaking stretching back at least 50 years, so in some ways we know quite a lot about it. And certainly it's also true that governments seek to be informed by evidence, sometimes seek to justify or legitimate 
their policies on the basis of evidence produced by academics and others. So the first part of our conversation today is going to be about the record on evidence-based policy making, the record on follow the science. What is the evidence on evidence-based policy making? First of all, I'm going to turn to Paul to talk about the record in the UK. <coughs> Oh, put the mic on. Uh, so in terms of my experience, it, it is largely academic, you know, to sum up, uh, you know, what, what we know from studies of policymaking use of evidence. And, you know, uh, it, it, it um, you can boil down, I think, uh, lessons on the use of evidence into two main messages. You know, first is policymakers have to ignore almost all evidence to make choices, you know, because uh, information is infinite and their capacity is, is finite. And they exist within a policy process that they struggle to understand and, and have limited control over. Um, so, I mean, I suppose for a long time I was um, carrying along with those assumptions uh, with uh, minimal interest. But there has been this really growing interest in uh, among academics in, in terms of the relationship between evidence and policy. And it tends to be around this kind of question, why don't policymakers listen to my evidence or why do they ignore my evidence? And it tends to be expressed most strongly by people within health and public health and uh, you know, climate science who, who would say they think they have very high quality evidence and they, they're just not sure why uh, policymakers wouldn't do more about it. So usually I think the answer would be in terms of three categories. The first is, uh, you know, people think of the evidence in very different ways, and that includes policymakers. So often when people wonder why people ignore evidence, it's a particular form of evidence, you know, at the top of a, a notional hierarchy. You know, they, they mean, you know, why do they ignore trial evidence or randomised control trial evidence? And, you know, most people have this, this kind of wider sense of what evidence counts within politics and policymaking. The second would be that, uh, again, they have to ignore most of it, so they have to find ways to act efficiently. So that is, you know, setting goals, uh, relying on a small group of experts or sources, and using their, their gut and emotion to, to understand uh, problems quickly. And the third thing, I think is the biggest contribution of policy studies, which is to say, uh, if you understand the environment in which people make these choices, you can understand the role of evidence within them. So I'd break that down to five five things quickly, you would say there are many policymakers and influencers spread across government. So, you know, there's not one single centre. Each of these venues has its own rules and understandings of policymaking. Uh, each of these venues has its own networks between policymakers and influencers. They, they, they talk about sort of dominant ideas or beliefs about policy problems, and they're all responding in different ways to different socioeconomic conditions. So. It, it's not surprising that people are frustrated with the lack of relationship between evidence and policy making because it's not clear what policy making is or how it works and therefore the relationship between policy making evidence will always be unclear. So usually I, you know, I like to end with a kind of positive message which is you know, if you feel frustrated by that process it's because it has to be frustrating and, and, and lack of understanding because it's so it's, it's so complex you know it's not it's not a failing of individuals <clears throat> oh you are on mute apologies that's two in a row we've been on mute Thank, thanks Paul that was a, that got us off to a really great start and you're so are you seeing this from your perspective so for my perspective, I'm a little bit more radical on the role of science, uh, maybe because I'm a scientist myself who have been drawn to uh, governance, uh, po govern government position, but also just because in Rwanda we are like that. So in Rwanda, since the mid 90s, the government focus its development on human development because we don't have a lot of we, our richest is the people. We don't have gold uh, and, and many other things like that that can pay for things. So we need to, to, to base our development on human. And to do that, uh, with when you don't have money and you are poor like we are, we cannot do that without knowing our contextual factors. And what happened, because the government used to plan 
having a plan that all other sectors are obliged to, to follow. Because this plan is not made by the cabinet per se, it's made starting at district level and come through the local government to the rest of the government. Everybody at all level have some duty to do during the year, some commitment with true indicators. And for this, we need to know where we come from and where we want to go, what will be the step along the, the year and what will be the budget. People who take leadership position take commitment to do that. And having evidence-based decision allow us to make each and every one accountable to the step, to the achievement, to... Uh, of course, we can have unexpected issues like COVID that dry, uh, uh, take out a portion of the budget, etc. But it's explained with evidence. So we take pride of making strong reduction in like under five mortality, maternal mortality, uh, other indicators like universal access to HIV, where we do even better than other uh, very developed country or place like New York, just because we use the science and not the science only of uh, the, the the demographic and survey, but cetera. But the last medicine, what it take, what are the the the, the side effect, and make sure that we have economy of scales by have strong protocol with the cheapest way to produce the same effect and not allow, not make the maximum with the money you have. So this progress is the result of building a strong health sector, even in the middle of having nothing, and also uh, based on primary care and how uh, even without having per now birth registry, make sure that everybody has a, a health insurance. And this process of evidence-based decision using science, uh, whatever science you need, your plan, you have to say where it come from. Uh, what are the evidence you use? And you have to uh, reference your plan like you reference a peer review article and you are accountable to it. And without evidence base, without all those steps that are evidence with research, uh, without knowing your contextual factors, what are the best suitable implementation strategy for the best implementation outcome? What is really implementation science? evidence-based approach. You will not have the result we have here in Rwanda with $800 per capita, exactly 826. And we will not have managed a greater health sector that can manage as we manage today uh, the COVID pandemic. So evidence-based, yes. Sci using scientific evidence, absolutely. And the, all the, the politicians are educated, so they know what research should be, and they should do the best for their people, and working together and having silo where everybody thinks by their own and doesn't come together, harm your people. So I'm for evidence-based approach, basing on science, and this is my story. Thank you, that's been really helpful. You've, you've set out, two quite contrasting approaches to the use of evidence and policy making. I'm characterizing a lot here and simplifying a huge amount. But I think Anne, you've, you've portrayed something which is rationalist and planned and quite heavily reliant on science. Whereas Paul in the UK, it sounds a bit more, excuse me, chaotic and political and as if we're muddling through more than planning that, you know, use of evidence. Lucia, what are your thoughts on this? Thank you. Um, I thought I'd give a, a brief overview of some research I've been involved in from both the Global South and North. This is from work in South Africa and how it's reformed some work recently in Scotland responding to COVID. Um, so in South Africa, I've been very privileged to have worked for the last decade up in the rural Northeast with a unique group who've supported the health system post-apartheid over 25 years, building data systems to inform policy. 
And for several years, this is pre-COVID, um, and working closely with South African scientists, we developed something called Learning Platforms. And they bring local service users um, and providers together to combine the core statistical data from the South African Centre with community knowledge on the realities of service delivery and priorities of local communities. And this helps us understand how systems come together as a whole, from different perspectives, how they can adapt and how they can meet um, rapidly changing needs. And through that, we have supported the up into health services, albeit at a relatively local and operational level. It's taken time to build those relationships, even in such a supportive research environment. Communities told us, for example, that a main priority was lack of clean, safe water. And while this is fundamental for health, the health system actually has very little direct responsibility for water. So we immediately had to expand into multi-sectoral collectives. And that's been challenging. There are deep divisions between people and the authorities in this area. But we've persevered and over time the process has been well received. Both government and policy stakeholders report positive shifts towards unifying sustainable partnerships to solve complex and quite deeply entrenched problems. And the learning platform, actually just in the months before COVID and lockdown in South Africa, it was taken up and introduced in the province and district. So we hope it will be well placed to support the development of multi-agency, community-led responses as COVID um, progresses in South Africa. At the same time as the pandemic hit in the UK in March in the Centre for Health Data Science at Aberdeen, um, this is a research group with long-standing relationships with the Scottish Health Service. We recognise that this kind of cooperative learning approach could support frontline practitioners, planners and managers who were basically operating in the dark without any evidence of what works to deal with a novel virus. And we rapidly stood up multidisciplinary teams, epidemiologists, social scientists, data scientists, to work directly in step with practitioners, collating and providing data and evidence in real time to support the response. Now, as our situation moves into something of its next phase here in Scotland, we're consolidating this whole systems learning as an affirmative approach to recovery that supports effective local implementation, which is critical, critical for outbreak preparedness and response. And we're now working with at-risk groups to understand vulnerability to COVID in the city and the surrounding rural areas. We're developing community engagement strategies to support new activities like contact tracing. And in a similar sense to the work in South Africa, we're connecting communities with different public service providers through the research process to inform and co-produce practical responses. And I think these experiences suggest that in situations of complexity and uncertainty, policy can be usefully informed by knowledge on the ground from the perspectives of those providing and using services that can promote communication, accountability, trust, um, and that in turn informs, supports and strengthens the response. The work here in Scotland has been deeply informed by approaches to public health research from rural South Africa and we hope to continue exchanging internationally, building these data-driven, inclusive decision-making processes with the most vulnerable populations as an ethical response to the pandemic. But this kind of action research and implementation science is often seen as less scientific or less robust. So we need thought leaders um, to support these approaches for rapid decision making where local intelligence is important. Thanks, Lucia. I think you've done exactly what you just recommended that others should do, which is to put forward a strong case for that style of research and how it's able to inform policy making, which takes us nicely onto our second topic. Of course, we're considering and reflecting upon evidence-based evidence policymaking during a global pandemic, which shines a much stronger light on all of these issues and gives extra urgency to be able to do, to being able to do this effectively and do it well, serving the interests of people who are affected by the pandemic. 
So the next topic we're coming on to is in this time of COVID, how could we improve evidence-based policymaking and perhaps take a stronger approach to feeding science into policymaking and into better decisions that better <coughs> serve the public? So, Agnes, I'm going to come to you first for thoughts about all of this, including how universities are able to support this activity. Thank you. It's a crucial question, knowing that you know, it's not in the middle of uh, uh, a war that we, uh, we, we start building an army. Uh, <clears throat> but what we can do uh, now is accountability. You know, what I was saying, uh, how a government should work, uh, based, uh, you take in decision based on evidence, um, so that we know where we come from, what we want to do, and what exists out there, doing your own work, like desk review, what exists out there, what we can do. We should do that now and more than ever, because we all face an epidemic that is, a pandemic that is new, where we learn new things every day. So we need to have people who learn every day what is new and how we can apply, but make people accountable of not doing their job. When you have a politician who just ignore uh, what the science has proven to be right and true and need to be done, and just pass through it without being accountable, when there are thousands of people who will die, it's not just. We should bring them, that's my point of view, we should bring them to tribunal for accountability. They had solution to do differently. They didn't did it. They have to explain why. Um, so what to do is to use science. We have scientific around all around us, hmm? and politicians should take them in account and take decision accordingly. And we can do that. So what to do now in between crisis is to educate politician. And I, I'm going to tell you a story that it's personal. When I was permanent secretary and even National AIDS Control Commission and after when I was minister, I put all my directors at master program to make sure that they cannot tell me I don't understand the numbers, to make sure that they advise me properly. They just have to sign a retention contract for four years after completion. But I had people that can really advise me using science. Why not to do that as a base of governance because we don't govern for us, we govern for the people. And when we do it badly, people are dying and we are accountable. So accountability should be the first. Using the science of the day should be the second. And who refuse it should be answerable to that. Now the role of universities is to do the research that help the leaders to do better or to do right. And as we just hear, implementation science is the avenue for that. If the world today was using all the science known to take decision, we will already save so many people, so many lives. And the other thing is to have an equity lens. Whatever you do, think about how you are going to involve the most vulnerable and not increase inequity. And this is, you can do that using research. Again, produce scientific results that has to be used for decision making. And this can be done immediately if politicians were accountable. Thank you. Lots of absolutely fascinating points in there. Without wishing to be provocative, do you see across the world politicians being more accountable? in some countries than others? I see countries where there is no accountability. Huh? I can say the, 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 as politician, I want today all the people learning that the house is flat, uh, that the house doesn't turn around the sun and the sun turn around. Yeah, and pass through that. What is not acceptable? This is not democracy, you know. A democracy is a service of people, not a service of strange brain who do what they want. So I think we should redefine what democracy is to oblige leaders to use 
science to take decisions so that they help people and they don't pull them down. Thank you. So normally in, in a democracy, there are elections every four to five years. In the absence of an imminent election, how would you suggest that politicians should be held accountable for using the science or not using the science? You know, are we sure that if we pull them in front of uh, international tribunal, they will not be unsearable? If me as a leader, I give harm to people, um, arms now, to kill others directly, I will be accountable in international tribunal. And those people with mismanagement and refusing science are killing more and just pass through it. Thank you. You're making some very powerful and entirely reasonable points there. Thank you very much, Paul. Well, um, <laughs> I, I um, I'm not sure what to say. I, I mean, I, I think I think we began with this um, distinction between you know rationalist approaches and you know uh, say complexity approaches, and I and I think I wouldn't see those as distinctions between the UK and. Rwanda or other countries, I would say there are differences in perspectives. You know, the, a rationalist approach is something that we require to turn what we want to do into policies. A complexity approach is a description of what happens when you try to do that and, and a description of the inevitable failure. And uh, so for me, that really informs the ways in which we think about accountability because if you accept that people can only understand so much of the world and they have so much control over it, then it's hard to hold them to account for everything that goes on, as in the UK system where you know, ministers are essentially responsible for everything that goes on in their departments. Now, I think, I think when I describe that, I'm describing something different from Magnus, who I think is describing people who are, uh, you know, just uh, individually not doing their jobs correctly. And I think those are different things, aren't they? Holding, individuals to account for their behaviour and holding governments to account uh, in a wider sense in terms of their their capacity. I mean, the, the other thing that, that struck me was the there are lots of different models that you can call evidence-informed or evidence-based policymaking. And I think I've heard two of them described in the discussion so far. So I think one of them is a relatively hierarchical system in which there are very clearly defined or narrowly defined notions of what counts as evidence and as scientific evidence. And you deliver policy from the center because if you know what the problem is and you know what the evidence is on how to do it, then you roll this out uh, sometimes uniformly. I think that's, that's one model that I think lots of researchers have in mind in the UK when they wonder why people don't pay attention to their evidence. It's a very kind of you know, there's one good body of evidence and we should do the same thing with it. Uh, now, I, I think the alternative is, I think, the sort of thing that Lucia was describing, which is much more local, based on governance principles, based on respect for different forms of knowledge uh, and not, not simply scientific knowledge and, and thinking about, uh, you know, uh, how people give meaning to particular policy problems and how they, you know, emphasising cooperation. And I think the interesting thing there is you can have two uh, very consistent models of evidence for foreign policy making, but in lots of ways they contradict each other. You know, so for example, one of them is relying on a very small group of experts, uh, with the other model it would be relying as many people as you can to give you knowledge. Uh, one of them is, you know, roll it out from the centre as, as much as you can to localities and, and stakeholders. And each of them are fine. I think it presents different implications for how you you know judge success and and how you hold people to account. You know, so in the in the more stakeholder one, say the UK central government pursued the you know more, more localism, more stakeholder involvement, you know more voices. It would be very difficult to envisage holding them to account for what happened, because. They, at the start, they had, they, had, they had essentially signaled that they would not be responsible for what happened. So you would essentially only hold them to account for the, the initial choice that they made there. Uh, so, I mean, at the risk of, of waffling a bit, I mean, I think the, the final thing I would say on the, on the UK is that its response to COVID, I think, has been relatively centralist 
and based on narrow scientific principles. So it, in, a, in a very narrow sense, it has, been, it has followed the science very, uh, you know, almost to the letter, because what that means is they've relied on a very small group of scientists and scientific bodies who have given them advice that they have followed quite consistently, at least in the in the rush up to lockdown. So I think in those terms about who's going to the the tribunals, I, I, I'd say the UK government ministers, I, I, had, I think have almost nothing to worry about in those terms we've described because they have followed uh, their scientific advisors, you know, almost to the letter and they run up to the, the lockdown. Thanks. That's a, a fascinatingly different perspective on this and full of really important points. Um, if we just take the UK context on its own for now, we've got four different governments. They all claim to be following the science. Why are they doing such different things? Well, shall I take that one? I mean, yeah, I, I think I, I think there are two things to say there. The first is in the run-up to lockdown, I mean, I think that's probably the most profoundly important part of it, the run-up to the lockdown the 23rd, they all pretty much did and said the same thing uh, up to that point. Uh, so they were all kind of following the same information, which was a little, which was a little bit, uh, un well, no, which was unhelpful, you know, because they locked down uh, too late. But, but that was, I think, a similar response across all nations. Since then, I think you're you're starting to see differences in the timing of the relaxation of lockdowns and a difference in the language they use to do it. But I, but I don't think, oh, there goes my door. Yeah. I, I don't think that they've, they've done things that differently. I think they've used the same information and they've just, it's been very much about the, the, the description and the timing of what's going on that's really mattered. Thank you. Lucia, we'll come to you next to cover some more about this topic of how could we do things better and where do universities fit into it all? Thank you. Um, I think a lot of Paul's work has helped me understand a lot of times the way policy issues are raised and framed is really important. Paul refers to a competition for ideas and taking Agnes's points on board um, and with South African colleagues thinking about an equity focus, we often think about, well, whose voices count in, in um, these situations? And that, as I described, really led us to a decentralised data-driven approach. But it's not just that. Working in South Africa has taught me that working to combine top-down direction with bottom-up innovation, insight and energy perhaps is a useful way to go. Um, and that brings me back to the point of evidence and how evidence is generated. Um, I think while good and thorough analysis is of course important, research is often extremely slow. It's not unusual to take years from collection of data to publication of results. And that is simply not fit for purpose, um, where data interventions and communications of interventions need to happen in a matter of days in our, in our new normal. So I think we need that combination of the top down and bottom up. We need agile and embedded research to support local decision making in real time. Um, but strategically to gain traction at higher levels, I think we need we need tools to, to, to deal with those higher levels of power that are often dominated by business and, and the corporate sector. Thank you. And how do you see that playing in the context of COVID? Where are you seeing the, what I take to be excessive influence by business and the corporate sector? The chair? Well, I think we're seeing some troubling shifts in England. Um, I don't think we're necessarily entirely the same in Scotland, but certainly in England, there seems to be a lot of um, commercial activity around um, testing, tracing, perhaps not so much isolation, but certainly those activities and a withholding of data on notifiable events. COVID became a notifiable event in this country in March. 
However, private organisations who are collecting data, which is of course reasonable, but however are not sharing that information locally, again for local planning. We've had a serious outbreak um, in one part of our country um, and public health directors in that location, again, were in the dark. Um, so I find that quite a, a difficult thing to understand. I think that's a really important point that we can't have evidence-based policy making if policymakers or indeed local policymakers in the case you're referring to can't get access to the evidence that would help them to prepare and implement policies successfully. Paul and Agnes, do you want to add anything else to this topic before we move on? Yes. I would like also that uh, I, I didn't understand, Paul, what you say about we, sh uh, we should not only take scientific um, uh, research because what is done at community and even the traditional knowledge, all this for me is uh, if we put a good system to understand it and use a method, it's scientific information. All this is scientific information. And when I say making people accountable, who are those people who bypass regulation to share data? I'm sorry, there is accountability to just notice that is not enough. The people have the right to be protected. And those people who doesn't share data should go and sleep in jail. That's my point of view, because they did that by purpose. So that, that means the accountability system doesn't follow the democratic vision of the right of people. So shall I just, uh, I, I think on the scientific point, I, I, I think what we probably should have done at the start was uh, come up with a list of definitions, shouldn't we? Because I think um, <laughs> yeah. if, if um, I think particularly in the UK, I think when, when people describe scientific Im information, they, they have a, a very narrow range of subjects in mind that doesn't include, you know, uh, wider sources of knowledge. So, you know, right or wrong, I think if, if, if I was to describe scientific information, and maybe it would be in quotation marks, you know, to, to demonstrate that a lot of people think of science as, a, you know, in relation to a very narrow set of methods. Okay, so if, if we were to say that scientific information is actually a, a collection of many sources of knowledge from many people, uh, then, then good. I mean, I think that's that's a good political point to make, I think. Um, in terms of information sharing, I mean, the only thing I would say is uh, I, I th there, there have been, I mean, there have been these operational issues that come up and there are these problems with people uh, not sharing information for intellectual or commercial reasons. I mean, I think often universities will not share information because they want to publish first as well. I don't think it's just private sector. But I think the problem that's come up with COVID has been this uh, debate about should uh, track and trace type systems be centralised or decentralised? And I think my impression is that the decentralised argument it is, is winning. And certainly uh, in Germany, they appear to have given up on a centralised model. And I think in the UK, they gave up on it and partly because of the sense that the, the, the centre would be retaining too much information. That would be brilliant for researchers and for you know rapid response, but not brilliant for a sense of public trust in who keeps your information and how the how long they use it and such like. So I would say that that type of uh, issue is still kind of unresolved during the crisis. Okay, thanks to all of you. We've covered our first two questions of what's the record like in different parts of the world on evidence-based policy making. And then secondly, how could we contribute through universities and through other organizations to make this work a bit better? We've got one final section in our discussion, which is to consider some questions that have been submitted by members of the community here at Aberdeen and elsewhere. And we'll take those in sequence. So we have three in particular to look at. And the first one is, how are universities engaging with ministries of health and other relevant health organisations in following the science? Agnes, would you like to take that one first, please?
You're muted. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so uh, the question is how a university can link with the decision makers to improve um, health outcome. So that means university are full of researchers. And uh, I think our job is also to be at service of the population, meaning we can identify what are the needed, uh, the, the gaps in knowledge now for the politician to do the right thing. Like now we are all going to go slowly in stopping the lockdown, resume flight and everything. How to do, uh, uh, that's like a question of research. How to do that local, uh, without harming locally? It's not the same here than in UK, than in Scotland, than elsewhere. So we need to customize our work to serve the people by helping the politician to have the information to take the best uh, decision. And also when we talk about we should stand uh, dramatically, drastically on the value of the traditional knowledge or the community knowledge, because many things has failed in this pandemic management because people didn't follow it, people didn't trust, people didn't, uh, didn't, uh, didn't uh, uh, understand what we were saying. I can say things one thing, the other day they said the other thing they did political statement about a, a pandemic more than a scientific statement about how to manage it how can we change that and this is our role and uh, i have to say that unfortunately since even Ebola, since even a long time ago many <coughs> universities have did, did did research lot of publication but keep that if they are not used, it's okay. No, you make sure that your, the knowledge you generate is used so that we can save more life. Thank you. Lucia, would you like to take this one next, please? Do you mean to follow still on? on next still question. on the first question on engaging with ministries of health? I very much agree. Um, I read a statement on Twitter by the editor of BMJ Global Health, A. Ambimbola. He was talking um, last week about how many authors don't realise the reason why they're writing papers. <laughs> I think that reflects some of what um, Agnes was saying. I think um, we could do a better job in universities of incentivizing. I think we've made important shifts in recent years, but I think we could do more about incentivizing those connections and relationships. This is beyond dissemination. Um, this is about working relationships. And as Paul was describing, those, those policy circles um, that make significant input, inputs to how policy is made. Thank you. That's raising a, a wider set of questions, which I'm going to ask Paul to say something about, which is incentives for academics to engage with the policy process and, and to attempt to influence policy decisions. How are you seeing that? Well, I mean, I suppose there's two parallel tracks here, you know, the kind of more general one and the COVID one. So if I, if I describe the sort of um, engagement with universities during the, the crisis, I would say, you know, there are these different phases. The first is you've got uh, uh, sort of high status professors in some universities who are part of advisory groups that have a direct engagement with government. And I think that has been a really important function. It's been a kind of narrow pool of recruitment, but it's been a very uh, regular and responsive process. And then it's been followed by identifying research questions that universities can help answer. So. I mean, just going through the stage minutes and papers, you know, they, they kind of were gearing up to the big one, which is the, the immunology. And, you know, if um, if someone has had COVID, will they be immune the next time? That sort of thing. So, I mean, it's, it's a little bit worrying reading that stuff, but, you know, people are still not sure if 
uh, you know, about, about key things, you know, uh, you know how, how long are people infectious and um, how far can droplets carry and that sort of thing. So there's clearly a role for universities in responding to calls from research funders to fill those gaps. And, and you've seen a kind of remarkably quick process, at least in the UK, where they've put out a call for research funding and, and funded a huge number of projects. That's you know, kind of good responsive stuff. In terms of the more consensus more generally, I think certainly I've grown up knowing, grown up uh, in my career knowing that uh, the first thing someone will do when they look at your CV is look at your publications and where they, where they are. And it's been very recently that they'll look for indicators of impact that are tangible. And even then, I think it's not a universal drive towards impact. It's a concentrated one in a small group of people who can demonstrate it to such a high extent that it's worth writing about in a, in a case study or something like that. So, uh, so with, with colleagues, we've been doing some research on research engagement type initiatives and, you know, uh, you know what, what they're for. And I, I can share that with you later. You know, I don't want to summarise it too much. But even then, when government bodies and research councils fund that kind of engagement, it's quite difficult to know what they want them to do or what what output they expect from it. It's going to impact in a general sense, but they're not sure if it's to, you know, help governments solve the policy problems they raise or if it's to do something else, help the careers of early career researchers or or encourage equity amongst researchers or social groups. I mean, I think right now it has been, you know, research should help us solve a, an urgent problem as identified by government. But more generally, I think that's not that's not as clear. OK, thank you all. We have a second question that's come in, uh, which refers not to policymakers or researchers or academics, but to the student community and what role they might play in forging student-led alliances in COVID research. Lucia? Um, yeah, so for the last few years in the School of Medicine, we've been... Um, taking a slightly different approach to teaching. We've been um, progressing something we call work-based learning, whereby we directly connect trainees, our students, with a range of organisations, NGOs, service providers, international research groups, to actively put classroom teaching into action in student-led projects. Um, and we find this transforms learning. It provides important professional and networking experiences and it's quite a positive way for those undergoing training to engage, um, to gain hands-on experience with, with different groups, including policy groups, to gain that wider sense of the sort of ecology <laughs> of evidence and policy and understand the entire environment, perhaps, as they train to operate in it. Thank you. Agnes, how does this work in your university? So in our university, I think there is um, uh, a community college uh, where each student have to uh, contribute in ideas, research and also practice to raise uh, the, the, the awareness of the community surrounding us and um, the, the, <laughs> and the country if um, uh, possible, but also uh, for the medical education in six years, and it's also unaffordable for the majority of African students, not for the other, Afri the other students. So what we do, we have done, we have made the medical education free for all at one condition, to serve during six to nine years, it depends, a committee will judge, uh, at the service, they keep their entire salary, but they will work in a place where the world needs them. It can be with um, street uh, destitute people in European countries or US. It can be among the Aborigines in Australia. It can be among the, the remote district in Rwanda. They keep their salary, they can, they can even own tons of money, but they, they turn their knowledge in service during nine to six years. Six years when it's a very hard place like uh, I can take a um, uh, refugee camp in South Sudan. Second, we want them to put their practicum 
around uh, uh, solving a problem of a destitute community. Like an example, uh, there are two students doing uh, assessing COVID knowledge and attitude uh, uh, that affect mental health among students in Rwanda. There is also a knowledge and practice around COVID in refugee camp to see what we can do. So student can contribute. We doesn't have to forget that the last the work they do to get the degree is in money invested for the wellness of the population that they should turn in knowledge that can help the population as much as the knowledge they receive. So there is I, th those are three examples, but I can go on and go on. Thank you, Lucia. You wanted to add something? Thank you. That makes me think of your last remarks, Paul. Uh, I wonder if you might share with us any views you have on students and other researchers investigating questions that perhaps aren't mandated from the government, I mean. Okay, uh, so I mean, I was going to say, so I, I run a, a master's in public policy and I think what, what, when I started teaching, it would be a kind of traditional format, which was, you know, policy process is really complicated, write me an essay, 10 pages, you know. Uh, whereas now it's, uh, you know, um, the world is very complicated, but, you know, we really need to change it. So write me a one page policy analysis and make it feasible. And I, and I think the, the the thing I suppose we you might struggle with during that process is is to balance two different things. You know, one is a sense of pragmatism where almost all of the policy analysis type advice is to be pragmatic, think of who your client is and frame things in terms of your client. And uh, that really sets boundaries on what you can say or how much you can challenge. Uh, and that's good. That's good advice for a career. Uh, but it's not good advice for people who are dissatisfied with their clients and dissatisfied with the world around them and they want to change it. And I, I, I don't have an answer for that one. Usually I kind of eke that one out and then the, the course is finished. You know, we don't we don't quite get to it. But I think there's a tension there about the training we give to students in terms of how to improve their careers and the training that we might give them to facilitate a more uh, equitable world. And I think, you know, that, that, that was still some of that is, is kind of unresolved for me. Thanks to all three of you. We have one final question to look at, and that is how can universities in both the Global South and North promote more equitable research alliances? Agnes. <clears throat> I think that, yeah, uh, this is a, a great question uh, because the problem is, in fact, the money for research are in the nose. And there is all a setting to do a lot of research in the South. So, and majority of research are not necessarily set up agenda by the researcher in the North. They are set up by those who give the money. So if we could partner together to change the way the money is given so that there is a respect of researchers both sides and uh, we go together for, for research that help the community where we live in. I'm part of, like for COVID, we need to have a solution if I'm doing a research, it's not going to be for Rwanda because what the hell is useful to have a solution for here? Because it will not last. We need solution that is applicable to many parts of the world. We need to go together for such an approach. Second, the ownership uh, of the research should be really co-owned. And also, because the way to do research in this part of the world where I am is far low, the, the, the capacity to do. No research should not go with capacity to do a series of people in this part of the world and, and drag them. And publication. And the, the other thing is you tackle this, uh, it, um, it was tackled before, is the more you publish in prestigious journal, the more you are known. Even if your publication is used, save no life. 
we should have another index about impact in saving life for health. That's how we do it. Not uh, what is there. And you know, it's like an imperialism and it is like a, a, a dictatorship. What is there now? I can do a research with uh, uh, one district here and contribute to change the world. And another one, just because he's known, is publishing uh, in Nature or somewhere else. Uh, he will be blessed and known and renowned. We have to change that and put the science at the right place. So put the science at the right place, change the norms of uh, um, of award, uh, uh, bring research that is mutually benefiting, huh? and recognize the right of the, the, the both sides. Uh, Thank you. Paul. Cool. Well, that's good. I, I don't want to have the last word on this, because uh, I think I, I'm conscious I, I, I can uh, symbolize the problem. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the problem is this dominance of white male professors in Western countries, right? So, but I think I came up with the same recommendations nonetheless. So I think I would put them down to three. So, uh, you know, don't assume that the same principles and practices of research apply <coughs> universally. And I think that really means don't assume that whatever works in the UK or the West, you know, should be applied across the world. Um, address the impact of the rules of research or the gatekeeping on researcher status. So I think that, put, put, put as bluntly, it would be the rules you have about good research, uh, privilege people in the North and exclude people from the South. And, you know, acceptance rates and memberships of editorial boards are kind of uh, biased against people in the South. Um, and, um, the final thing, I guess, is, you know, don't treat uh, research in each country like a, a temporary visit, uh, you know, because that, that is kind of characteristic of a lot of, you know, say UK researchers <laughs> go to African states as, uh, and do a little bit of research and then go home and write about it and forget about it, you know. So instead, you know, develop partnerships built on mutual status and respect and, and treat them as for the long term rather than as for, you know, instrumental ticks on the CV. Thank you. And uh, Lucia? Um, not much to add from this side, except I keep thinking of the phrase, we blame society, but we are society. Um, I think <coughs> characters, academics have an important role to challenge these systems and hierarchies that can be exploitative. And it's about values. It's about inclusion and equity. Um, and acknowledge that we need to reconfigure those systems. Thank you very much to all of you. We started our, off with quite a simple question, which what does it mean to be following the science? And, and between your comments and observations and analysis, I think we've seen that this is in fact much more complex than that simple question would suggest. First of all, because there isn't a single science for anyone to be following. There are multiple pieces of scientific evidence that need to be sifted and compared and potentially drawn upon. Secondly, that our governments are working in very different circumstances, as we've heard in different parts of the world, the histories of government intervention, the problems that governments are trying to deal with make a difference to how that science is used. And then thirdly, governments are trying to pursue different objectives. They have different purposes in drawing upon the circumstance, on the science. They're trying to achieve, achieve different things. And the same is true for the public, that the preferences may be different in different places. So all of this is quite messy and complex and non-linear. Nevertheless, you've given us lots of good clues about how we could try to improve it. And I'm sure when the history of the global crisis comes to be written, evidence-based policy making or the lack of it will be right at the heart of the narratives which are being produced. Let's hope though that the crisis itself is dealt with effectively as quickly as possible, that the evidence to the extent that it can be used is applied effectively so we get past the crisis and then some of our academic colleagues can get on with writing the history and we as a community with an interest in evidence-based policymaking will be able to move on to a different topic and one, let's hope, 
which is less threatening and less urgent. Thanks very much to all of you. That's been a super discussion. Bye for now.